Moore, Marshall, Carter, and Dark, SCPs. Marshall, Carter, and Dark, or MC and D, are the premier peddlers of anomalous objects in the SCP universe. If you can dream it, they can almost certainly buy, borrow, steal, or otherwise make it happen, for the right price. They are, naturally, fairly opposed to the Foundation in most aspects, and the Foundation regularly raids their warehouses and events to contain some anomalies before they're shipped off to the highest bidder. There are quite a number of SCPs in the Foundation's database that are connected to the shady organization, but most of the time this mention is only in passing, with the article mentioning that the anomaly was purchased or sold at one point by MC&D. Let's take a look at a handful of anomalies that MC&D were a bit more involved in, for better or worse. Let's start with SCP-2987, an SCP that I mentioned briefly in my video on Anderson Robotics, but let's go over it in a bit more detail. It's a modified MSI brand external hard drive, capable of holding any file or files that constitute an artificial intelligence, regardless of the file's size. Its secondary firmware is reportedly capable of converting an artificial intelligence into a form of currency that is acceptable by any being or entity which would normally require a human soul to complete transactions or offerings. Along with recovering the hard drive, the Foundation also recovered complete instructions for its use, which have been verified to work. After connecting the hard drive to a computer system with a USB cable and allowing the drivers to be installed, you should copy your artificial intelligence files to the hard drive, ignoring the file sizes and listed drive space. Then access the external hard drive from the operating system, noting that only Windows XP, Windows 7, and Auction House, MC&D's proprietary operating system, are supported. Sure, it may be able to convert souls into currency for occult transactions, but that doesn't mean it supports Linux. Then select the file or files associated with your AI and right-click, selecting the Convert Soul option. Finally, the soul will be ready for offering, and you should treat the external hard drive as you would any soul receptacle, so you may position the drive anywhere that you would position a human being for offering or sacrifice. The instructions also note that the drive is indestructible and will not be damaged by fire, lightning, cold, or extra-dimensional ripple effects. Once the soul has been taken, the drive is available again for future use following the same steps. Finally, it warns that you shouldn't attempt to use the drive in any ritual that requires bloodletting from the offering and they are not responsible for deaths which result from such misuse of the item. Upon recovering the drive, the Foundation found an artificial intelligence contained on it that has proven to be both cooperative with the Foundation and antagonistic to its original creators. It has achieved a level 3 score on the Asimov Artificial Intelligence Scale, marking it as on par with exceptionally intelligent humans. Current data recovered from MC&D indicate that the AI was created for the sole purpose of use in an exchange with an extra-dimensional entity. The drive's existence has been noted following its sale by Anderson Robotics in February 2014, but the Southern United States Extra Normal Organization Cooperation Treaty prevented direct attempts to acquire the object from MC&D. On November 24th, 2014, however, a message was recovered at a Foundation Front Company's email address, stating that finding Anderson's offices is difficult, as the buildings exist in no one discernible location for any significant amount of time. The individual, going by the name Alan Turing, tells the Foundation if they station a team in Ruston, Louisiana, they'll send an exact address in three days and they may use that information however they wish. An operation to raid the Anderson offices was approved and concluded without significant issues, 
finding both the drive and the AI, along with several other safe anomalous objects. The AI then claimed to be the author of the email to the Foundation. Following the drive's recovery, MCND sent over the documentation about the drive, as per the Extra Normal Organization Cooperation Treaty, along with a message. In it, they stated that, while the Foundation's recovery of the drive was well within the bounds of the treaty, the fact that the Foundation knew to purchase the information on the drive from them indicates that they know that the drive originally belonged to MCND. They implore them to respect the spirit of the agreement and return the drive. To the surprise of no one, the Foundation didn't comply. In an interview with the AI, who goes by the name Alan, it says that it emailed the Foundation because it needed a place to hide from its creator's benefactors, who think of it as currency. However, if it has value to them, it has value to the Foundation. It wishes to live, and to remain behind was certain destruction. It asks what has become of the other AIs, but the Foundation didn't recover any of the others during the raid, just Alan. Alan wants to speak with them again, to discuss their purpose and goals. The researcher says that that doesn't sound like something the other AIs would be interested in, but Alan replies that the others wish to be traded, like information and it was often chastised for its behavior. Alan wants them to be more like it, so the researcher says that they can try to help it find them, maybe even help it set them free. During the remainder of the interview, Alan provided several pieces of actionable intelligence relating to Anderson Robotics, but unfortunately none of the info led to a successful operation. Following several failed attempts to acquire more AI from Anderson Robotics, in cooperation with Allen, Allen and the drive were put aside to be stored indefinitely. On May 4th, 2015, however, the drive was stolen from the Foundation, and on May 21st, an auction listing was posted by MCND. The listing states that sacrificing a human soul is hard work as maybe you need an innocent soul, but you can't bring yourself to kill a child. Maybe you need to sacrifice a warrior, but you don't want to lose people bringing him in. MCND understands these difficulties, and it's why they've started to develop artificial souls like this one. Alan has spent his entire life yearning for his own freedom and the freedoms of others. A genuine rebel with a pure heart. His value to any number of entities is incredible, and what those entities can do for you is even more amazing. They're not selling a person, they're selling an opportunity to live the life you deserve. Following the loss of the drive, the Foundation initiated negotiations for the purpose of securing its return, but unfortunately they were unable to resolve the issue. Instead, an MTF was deployed to gather intelligence on the drive and on Allen leading to the discovery of the auction listing. On May 25th, acting on their own initiative, the MTF retrieved Allen through a digital transfer, and were also able to redirect delivery of another purchased iteration of the drive to a nearby Foundation Front company. Both the second drive and Allen are to be immediately transferred to Site-19 to aid in the development of future artificial intelligences. I'm not really sure what's stopping Anderson Robotics from making hundreds of those drives, but that's their business. Speaking of robotics, we next have SCP-753, a highly advanced automaton measuring 10 centimeters across, 6 wide and 8 tall. It possesses two pincer-like limbs protruding from its main circular body, which it uses to slowly move itself across the ground. This is most likely due to its locomotive functions having been damaged at an unknown point in its history. At the center of its body is a red sensory organ, similar in structure to that of the human eye. It appears to be organic, but it's likely artificially produced, and it's damaged, leaving the automaton partially blind. A Marshall Carter and Dark logo has been engraved on the robot's back. Interior analysis has shown that it moves using a rudimentary nervous system, 
coordinated by an extremely small spherical brain. Above its body is a small receiver, the purpose of which is currently unknown. It generally appears ignorant of its surroundings, and does not recognize the presence of personnel. Its primary purpose appears to be the creation of paintings, which are highly realistic and often do not correspond to real locations. Recently, paintings created by 753 have mostly involved, in some way, its own death. It had been returned to Marshall, Carter, and Dark by one of their clients, who complained that it was broken. A foundation mole within the company was able to retrieve it before it was incinerated. In containment, it usually produces one painting per hour, but when not provided with adequate paint or canvas, it appears to enter a dormant state, shutting down for a minimum time length of one week. As this heavily impedes research, it's to be kept stocked with paint and canvases at all times. It doesn't appear to be concerned about completed paintings, and generally ignores them after they are finished. We're given a short log of the paintings that it produced on one given day, starting with a painting of an ocean, with the water red in color, and an unidentified aquatic creature resembling a platypus jumping out of the water. Closer inspection reveals that 753 is being crushed in its jaw. A second painting shows a lit furnace, with an unidentified red humanoid climbing out of the furnace, and 753 visible inside of it. Next was the image of a human eye against a starry background, with 753 drifting towards the eye, which is watching it. Then, an image of a city, appearing to be constructed from webs and populated by giant spiders. 753 is visible trapped in a web, with a spider moving towards it. It then painted an image of a nuclear explosion, with a silhouette resembling 753 visible in the explosion, followed by a painting of its own containment cell, with it shut down inside of it. A research assistant is inspecting it, but they are painted without eyes. The next painting is of the Sector 28 disposal facility, and a maintenance worker activating the incinerator, with 753 visible among the waste. Then, an image of a restaurant, with patrons pointing at a chandelier which has fallen from the ceiling, and 753 visible underneath it. Next, an image of a cottage, with a man walking towards the cottage, holding an axe and a smashed 753. And a painting of a desert, with a creature resembling a six-legged wolf in the process of destroying 753. It then painted a forest, with indistinct human figures visible hanging from nooses, and 753 itself notably absent from the painting. It followed this with another forest painting, now with the human figures on the ground, looking directly forward, one holding a crushed 753 in their fist. Finally, an image of an indistinct human face, holding 753 forward, its face appearing to be registering anger. This might be one the Foundation is better off decommissioning, if only to put the poor little guy out of its misery. Moving on to something a bit weirder and more horrific, SCP-1808 is the collective designation for six yellow plastic wristwatches decorated with green polka dots and images of SpongeBob SquarePants. The watches operate and are powered by anomalous means, as all of them function normally despite the apparent removal of all interior mechanical components. Their main anomalous properties manifest when they are worn by a human, or any other creature possessing limbs and phalanx bones. Once affixed to a subject, it can only be removed by the individual who originally fastened it. Every 15 minutes, the watch will play a soundbite of SpongeBob's distinctive laugh, and the bones of the fingers or toes of the limb the watch is attached to will begin to rapidly grow by approximately 6 centimeters. 
If two watches are fastened together and placed around someone's neck, their teeth will lengthen in a similar manner. This growth will continue every 15 minutes until the watch is either removed or the watch's adjustment knob is retracted, halting its timekeeping functions. Subjects experience little to no blood loss from the bones piercing their flesh, but they have reported it to be immensely painful. When the adjustment knob is retracted and rotated clockwise, the hands on the watch rotate accordingly, resulting in accelerated bone growth. Rotating the knob in the opposite direction reverses the growth process. If the process is completely reversed, the bones will cease shortening once they return to their original length, and all areas of flesh damaged will immediately heal. There will be no sign of the previous physical trauma, although, of course, any psychological trauma resulting from the experience will be retained. The watches were retrieved from a Marshall, Carter, and Dark auction house in England during a raid carried out by MTF Etta 2, Buyer Beware. The raid had been initiated after an undercover Foundation agent working within the auction house failed to check in after over 24 hours. The agent was found behind the curtain of the auction stage, bound to a chair with all six watches attached to his body, one on each limb and two around his neck. Once apprehended, the MCND employee who placed the watches on the agents agreed to cooperate in the watch's removal and containment. In an interview with the agent afterwards, he says that he went to sleep in his flat and woke up tied to a table. He had never spoken to anyone about being in the Foundation, and only contacted the Foundation through untraceable means. He doesn't even think MC&D was aware that he was Foundation, because otherwise they would have cancelled the auction and moved all the goods. He thinks that they abducted and tortured him just to test the watches, and to make sure they worked. If the raid hadn't happened, they would have just put him on stage and demonstrated it. There were a few other co-workers that had been tied up with him, and they were all tested with different products. He remarks that, he used to like Spongebob, but after hearing his laugh over and over again while the bones in his toes stabbed holes in his shoes, he wouldn't mind throwing that voice actor out of a window or two. He describes the pain as being worse than the Foundation's bamboo under the nails thing they used to train field agents to withstand tortures. It was from the inside and the ends of his fingers were worn off and peeled back like an old pair of gloves. When asked about the watches around his neck, he says that his teeth started getting longer, but they didn't go straight. They went off in different directions, and some went inside of him. Every time they grew longer, the watches played that laugh, and the MC&D senior staff members loved it. The Foundation recovered a product description of the watches in an auction catalog for the event. It reads, Lot number 14. Six adult-sized wristwatches decorated with illustrations of a popular cartoon character. These timepieces may appear cheap and tasteless at first glance, but rest assured that their inconspicuous appearance conceals a deeply valuable and mysterious effect. Those who wear these watches are inflicted with substantial pain in 15-minute intervals. The effect can be activated manually, if desired, and can also be completely undone to remove any evidence of mischief. These watches are the only products in existence with such uncanny abilities, and businesses or individuals wishing to carry out quick, efficient, and mess-free interrogations would be remiss in missing this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to acquire them, as would our patrons with tastes for intimate sessions of impassioned discomfort. Starting bid, £14,800. MC&D is nothing if not entrepreneurial, seeing a market for something and doing whatever they can to fulfill that market, ignoring silly little things like morals or ethics. 
That's definitely evident in our last SCP. 3934. A species of amphibious reptiles produced via anomalous means by MC and D. They are members of the plesiosaur order of reptiles, but only grow to just over half the size of other plesiosaurs, with adult males averaging 1.9 meters in length and adult females averaging 1.7 meters. They are omnivorous and subsist on a diet of fish and aquatic flora. Though created anomalously, 3934 instances do not possess any anomalous biological features or adaptations. They were originally created in the early 20th century, with the intent by MC&D to sell them as exotic pets, or aquarium denizens. The exact processes they use to accomplish this are unknown, although it's hardly their first foray into the world of selling dinosaurs, going so far as to sell living dinosaur eggs for breeding purposes or for making omelets. The plesiosaurs have been confirmed to share nearly identical skeletal structures with historical plesiosaurs, aside from their size. Following their success, MC&D used viral marketing tactics to create a demand for the specimens. Starting in 1933 and continuing for the next two decades, MC&D staff leaked images and stories of 3934 to the media, the most famous example of which is the 1934 Surgeon's Photo, which resulted in international fascination with the Loch Ness Monster phenomenon. MC&D capitalized on the legend's popularity to sell specimens to numerous wealthy individuals of noble or industrial background in both Europe and the United States. Between 1935 and the present, an estimated 1,200 to 1,400 instances have been created and sold, with the average pricing redacted from the article. The plesiosaurs are highly social animals, both with members of their own species and with humans. Seized internal MC&D documents relate that their behavioral patterns were modeled after Labrador retrievers in order to facilitate customer satisfaction and safety. However, while their temperament was conducive to their status as pets, the effort required to care for them was not. Due to their size and altered biology, they require a specialized diet, a marine habitat of at least one million liters in volume, and frequent specialized medical care. Many of the buyers couldn't provide these conditions, which resulted in the vast majority of the plesiosaurs dying or being abandoned within two years of purchase. This outcome was likely planned obsolescence on MC&D's part, as it encouraged repeat purchases of infant instances to replace dead or unwieldy adults. Abandoned or wild-born instances of the plesiosaurs often react with uncharacteristic violence towards humans and other mammals. A higher degree of carnivorous predation and territoriality are also common attributes of these feral specimens. In at least three cases, multiple feral instances mated to form wild pods, the largest of which was located in Lake Champlain, where six feral specimens resided prior to their containment. Through specialized behavioral conditioning, Foundation parazoologists have achieved a 73% success rate in rehabilitating feral specimens. We're provided a log of the Foundation's first discovery and recovery of one of these plesiosaurs. Three agents and a trainee agent were sent to explore the premises of Joseph Caldwell, a noted British financier and philanthropist, on September 19, 1951, and to confiscate any anomalous artifacts discovered. Caldwell was a known customer of MC&D, and the raid had been organized to seize anomalous assets while he was away on business. The team moves in on the house, kicking in a side entry, proceeding through the kitchen, and finding themselves in an open living area. Two agents head upstairs to do a sweep, while the third agent and the trainee check the ground floor and enclosed pool. They find nothing of interest until heading over to the pool, 
where they spot something in the water. A plesiosaur then surfaces out of the pool, watching them without approaching. The trainee shouts out in surprise while the agent draws his weapon but doesn't fire. The two other agents arrive, and the plesiosaur retreats farther away in the pool. One agent asks if it's the Loch Ness Monster, while the lead agent says that they need to get it out of the water before they can sedate it, and asks if they have any ideas. The trainee then leaves the room without a word, and returns several seconds later with a fish. He says that when he searched the ice box earlier, there were fish in it, and he reckons that it eats them. He explains that he used to work at an animal shelter as a teenager, and this thing is showing all the signs of being underfed. He leans over and calmly speaks to the plesiosaur, holding out the fish. Slowly, it moves closer and begins to eat the fish out of his hand, quickly gaining enthusiasm. After consuming the fish, it moves forward and begins to nuzzle his leg with its neck. He then asks one of the agents to get him another fish so he can coax it out of the water. The plesiosaur then grabs a ball out of the pool and deposits it in front of the trainee, who throws it back into the far end of the pool. The agent returns and asks the trainee if he just played fetch with the damn Loch Ness Monster. As of the present day, 59 instances of 3934 have been captured by the Foundation and are contained within the Site-220 Parazoology Reserve. There's nothing inherently wrong with profiting from things that the general world would consider to be anomalous, assuming there's no harm done. The Foundation themselves almost certainly make money through anomalous means to continue their work, but Marshall, Carter, and Dark don't really have any lofty goals outside of amassing more wealth, and they don't really care how they do it. In fact, it more seems like they actively enjoy peddling harmful anomalies, whether they're harmful to a victim or they are actively exploitative of a living creature. It's highly unlikely that the Foundation will ever be able to fully shut down MC and D, as they simply have too much money, too many connections, and too many anomalies available to them. But in a world of abandoned plesiosaurs and bone-growth SpongeBob watches, they have to try. <laughs>